Good morning. Hey, Jeff. I'm Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi, Tracy. I see you there. <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah. And um, I guess these are the rest of uh, your group for the project or the consideration yeah, of the project. I'm, I'm Joyce Maturis, um, part of the um, expansion group. And I'm Sandy Small. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Is Evelyn on? Hi, Jeff. Uh, Evelyn is on audio. Okay. I don't see her on my screen. Uh, she's on. Hi, the Jeff. It, it says Evelyn with her. Oh, she just on. Um, she's all set now. She unmuted. Hi, Evelyn. Hi. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Hi, Jeff. It's Alicia Greco on the select board, too. Oh, hi, Alicia. How are you? Good. I hope everybody had a nice Thanksgiving. Yes, it was a little quieter than normal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, would Stuart like to introduce himself, please? Hi, I'm Stuart Lytle. I write for the Town Common newspaper. I wanted to see what y'all were up to. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Great. Uh, well, thanks, everybody. I appreciate the time today. Um, Tracy, my understanding is the purpose of our meeting today is to talk a little bit about the needs for uh, the Council of Aging and the possibility that they could be incorporated into the town hall renovations project and basically move them into town hall or expansion of town hall so that um, their needs could be accommodated in addition to town hall when that project eventually happens. Correct. This, do I've got it correctly? Okay. Correct. So just as a way of um, for the folks on the expansion committee to understand, you probably are familiar with this already, but I will repeat. Um, our firm, Context Architecture, has been involved with the town um, for a little while looking at the uh, expansion of the town hall, or I should say renovation of the town hall from its current purpose, which is a police station, back into a town hall. And we looked at multiple different options um, to do so uh, from the minimal of just you know, uh, renovating the space as it currently exists and predominantly in the lower level, which is a lot of the police spaces, to expanding it with an addition to accommodate the space requirements that the town really does have. And our, our, you know, because of the current situation, leasing space, you're able to afford yourselves of the additional space you have moving back into the old town hall would actually cause you to be crunched back up again. So um, we looked at a number of different iterations. At the same time, we were also working on the police station project, uh, which potentially could have been combined with town hall. Eventually, the select board decided uh, that that project would be done separately and is now heading rapidly towards completion on the lot a couple uh, uh, doors down from town hall. So um, the possibility exists with fire also being in the same complex and the town hall moving back that with Council of Aging being there, you will have a pretty much a lot of town government and a lot of town um, facilities all co-located in the same general region, which would be a great convenience for residents. So the, we know a pretty good deal about the building itself. We know quite a bit about what the town, uh, town hall and the town administration staff require. So the main purpose of this conversation, I think, is really to describe in more detail what Council of Aging needs from their spaces, from the administrative side all the way through um, you know, residents and everything that would be needed as part of that space. Um, this process is typically referred to as a space needs analysis. It's where we um, use our best judgment to consider the staffing requirements, the um, 
vehicle or parking requirements and most importantly the space requirements of this uh, department or, or um, component and um, it's pretty soup to nuts we want to go through everything um, you know from you know, the office space to the gathering spaces all the way down to how many bathrooms are needed and janitors hi i'm picking up a mobile order for alessandra our approach will um, ultimately lead us to create uh, what we what we did for the town hall, which is um, a draft first draft of this program, which will um, be a written document. And what we'll have is a staffing chart. We'll have a parking chart, and then we'll have a series of pages. Each page describes one specific space in. The Council of Aging. So, you know, if it's the director's office, we'll have a block of text at the top that will describe all the components that have to go in that space, what the floor finishes are, the wall finishes are, the HVAC needs, um, equipment, everything that will go in there. And then at the bottom half of that page, we'll actually have a little diagram that will show how the space could be laid out in its most ideal form. This is conceptual. It's not meant to be a design of the actual space that's potentially going to go into this building. Um, it's just a, a pure, minim as minimal a form as we can make it um, to be efficient, but also allow for the functions of that space. That will allow us to put all of these components together and, and tell you in some total what the space need requirements are for the entire um, uh, facility. So, um, I think, you know, it probably be a good idea, Cindy, if you could sort of start off with a description of the staff and, um, you know, how many there are, what their titles and roles are, and, and then sort of get into um, the, uh, if you have any vehicles, and then sort of get into what, in general, maybe other people can jump in at that point, in general, you're looking to achieve. Okay, so to start with staff, there's me, I'm the director. Mm -hmm. um, we have an outreach coordinator and we have a program coordinator. And that's it for staff right now. Um, our other staff is a you know, Meals on Wheels driver. She's out in the field and um, van driver, again, obviously out in the field. And then we do have the Council on Aging van in terms of needing space for that vehicle to be parked on site. And um, in terms of your staff, if we were looking forward, and this is the crystal ball part, which is hard, <laughs> because if we could predict this, we'd all be uh, playing the lottery. But um, in the yes, <laughs> very nice, you came prepared. Um, so in the future, looking forward 30, 40, 50 years in the future, and the growth of the community and mm -hmm. uh, the population that might be served by your program, do you? see the need to have additional staff bolstering your department? Just based on other local councils on aging, I would say yes, you know, with growth of the program, growth of the population, there could be room for an assistant director, there could be room for, um, you know, like a, a community liaison slash marketing type person. So, I mean, there's obviously the point is to grow. So it would, you know, I could foresee there being the need for more staff. Okay. What about administrative assistants or any sort of- Yeah, like an administrative staff? assistant slash receptionist type uh, role. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. I think it's safe to, to say probably twofold, one part-time for that period of time in the future to, yep. as an estimate. For admin assistants or just in total? In total. I mean, uh, much of this, and it's good that Trace is on the call, but much of this um, revolves around budgeting, you know, municipal budgeting and what budgets are like. And so, you know, you can predict what you'd like to have, but on the other hand, there's a there's a financial aspect pushing back right. too. So we don't want to, uh, we don't want to sell ourselves short for the space needs, but we also don't want to be too pie in the sky and make something that, you know, you'd never ever grow into, uh, which Usually doesn't happen to be frank with you <laughs> for financial <laughs> reasons. Um, okay. And in terms of uh, the number of people that you would serve 
and that the space should be designed for um, for a senior center. Um, do we? Do you have any? You know, basically looking around at some of the others, do you have any ideas of of what we should be thinking for to guests? So I don't have specific numbers. Obviously, the numbers from right now are, you know, even from before COVID, were very small. <clears throat> um, I think a lot of that has to do basically with the space that we had available here to be able to provide programs. Um, I don't know if Joyce or Sandy or Evelyn could speak to, you know, when they've had those programs in the past, like say at the library where there's been a speaker that comes, you know, in terms of attendance, my thought is that was a much greater crowd um, than something here at the senior center. I think our largest attendance that we received was for our, our first uh, presentation. And I don't exactly remember the attendance, but it was probably less than 50. Mm -hmm. Okay. I do know um, when there is like a, a, for example, a holiday dinner where there's entertainers and there's a meal served, that draws a much bigger crowd. Okay. Um, and obviously something we would want to be able to provide in our space. Yeah. Is, when you say a bigger crowd, you mean bigger than 50? Um, maybe 75, would you say, Joyce? Absolutely. And as we grow, it would even possibly be larger. We've always had to um, rent out or a larger space for us because um, naturally we didn't have it. And we were using Newburyports as of last Christmas. And... Um, we filled their largest section of that room. Mm. So, uh, but they had, we're hoping as you will hear as Cindy gives more of her presentation to have a large room that we can open up to be larger. So uh, we are addressing this. Yeah, and that, that's sort of where I'm getting at the, the sort of number of potential number of guests because there's different ways to do it and you, you hit on a, a great tactic you know a room that can be subdividable and have multiple purposes that's that's really useful um and i also want to it was interesting to hear you say that you did use surrounding community um spaces that were larger because if you did have the one-off event you did every year but you knew you were going to double your attendance always at that event there's always the possibility that you know for potential reasons, uh, financial and otherwise, that that would always be the case. You'd always go to some other larger event hall for that space and you you wouldn't necessarily need to build this particular facility for that once a year event. Um, I don't really have a dog in the fight necessarily, but it's, it's sort of different understandings of what you would like to have and I'm trying to learn it um, so we can put together the best program. And um, so what I'm hearing is that you know, right now you might be around 50, maybe a little less than 50 in most regular events, but then there's occasions where you're 75, 80, maybe even 100 um, at your biggest type of groups. And so the question becomes, do we accommodate 100% of that in this facility or do we say, okay, we're gonna accommodate most of it and then, you know, the overflow happens at an offsite place. Um, and we can talk about that um, after we've done the first draft of the program as to, you know, cause we'll do our first draft is a good point to make. We'll do our first draft based upon the most the sort of biggest, um, we'll get our arms around everything, you know, and it will present a first draft that may be way bigger than what you were expecting. And then we'll have to look at that and say, okay, this is what we heard and you wanted a lot. And now how do we strategize and figure out how this Put together this package in a more efficient way so you can still get as much as you need for the future but not too much and um and the big you know sort of the event space is really the, the biggest driver of that um so it, that, those are good points and we're um, at a little bit of a disadvantage jeff because our program's been somewhat well certainly has been limited because of our lack of space so we can't really give you the best stats, we're, we're in a position now where we're kind of um, thinking, build it, they will come kind yeah. of a situation yeah. because 
well, that, the more programming, the more space, the, I mean, the more space, the more programming, the more participation. So, so we don't really have the, the great, the greatest of numbers to offer you right now. And there's a, there is some value in looking at your peers, your mm -hmm. uh, towns that are similar size to you and what their population might look like and what their facilities, whether they're new or old, whether they're capable right. or not of serving their population. And so, you know, that's really helpful too. Um, and we use that data as well when we design buildings, looking at other comparables. Um, right. So, you know, any of that information is great to share. Uh, Cindy, I probably stopped you mid stream here, but did you, do you have additional things that you wanted to share about your, you know, the, the vision that's sort of out there as to what you would need for a set of spaces? So in terms of space for the office staff, um, I'm thinking private space for those, those three um, positions private that offices. I mentioned. Um, yeah. You know, obviously uh, the director, I think would need a private office, especially to the outreach coordinator. Um, when I first got on this call, I, I had to mute myself because she was right next to me, right over here. And um, she's, she's talking about private information about people's diagnoses and names and all that kind of stuff. So um, I would strongly suggest her having a private office. Um, same thing for the program coordinator, simply because that person's going to be on the phone and emails and whatnot, trying to coordinate um, and having a private space to be able to do that away sure. from where things are going on, um, I think is important. Yep. And um, for those three folks that are there, it's sort of the ad administration suite. I'm assuming a conference space yes. is important, but in addition to that, uh, there um, should each of these offices have um, space for smaller groups to meet within them. I mean, you know, typically an office would have a get one or two guest chairs at a minimum, so right. that they can meet with one or two folks in their office. But sometimes we put like a small table. You can have a group of four or five people meet in an office rather than a small conference room. So I've thought of that for the director's office. I think to have a, an area. Uh, in fact, I went to a, another um, Council on Aging, actually over in Georgetown, and that, that director's office had the same kind of thing. So I was... I was yeah, a small table there. with the four, four chairs. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then in terms of the conference space, how large of... Um, how many people should we just, you know, program that room for that you would meet with at one time? I'm assuming, you know, your entire staff, which currently is three and could be as many as uh, six people. Right, could be a little bit more if we had uh, like uh, eventually board meetings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're looking at maybe up to seven board members possibly, um, you know, plus the staff. I mean, maybe, maybe room for 10 or 12, I would assume. Yeah, it sounded like 12 was probably the right number given what I've heard. And would you, um, and you probably don't do this now, or maybe you do because of the situation we're within with COVID, but in, in a conference room, um, you're probably going to want technology mm -hmm. available. Um, mm -hmm. And these days, uh, there's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, a little bit older technology is a projector and a drop down screen, you get a bigger image. Um, but people are going away from that and doing just buying a large flat screen panel on you know, TV or something like that and putting that on the wall and you can plug whatever you want into that and, and do a presentation that way. The, the drawback is that you can't use a laser pointer on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's another option and that is a smart board, which you know, the schools tend to use more so than anybody else. And that is a whiteboard screen with a, a little short throw projector that projects onto that whiteboard and you can actually interact with it. Um, so there's are three different types of technology and it affects the program of the room a little bit. It doesn't lock you in. You know, if you tell me you want one now, there's no reason why if once you actually start building this thing out, you can't change your mind. Um, so just kind of feeling you out for what the preferences might be at this point. I had actually put um, a flat screen okay. on my notes on my list. So great. Uh, I'm assuming with the other folks that you're thinking in terms of growth that, um, you know, an admin assistant, 
um, might be someone that could have more of an open office. Yes. Um, but the other two, community liaison, an assistant director, you would think maybe just individual offices for those folks? Yes. Okay. Um, within the administrative area, a workroom for office supplies, yeah. printers, faxes, yeah. all that sort of stuff. Um, a, now, do you would you need a small break room, or is the kitchen facilities you know, essentially going to be common to everything, and you just use? Um, uh, my we haven't talked was, about it yet, but, but no. I mean, my thought was we would just utilize that; we wouldn't have a separate okay. break area. Do you do a lot of mailings, printed materials that you assemble and yes. mail out? Yes. Um, so that's going to happen essentially within this workspace. Do you have a mailing machine? Um, I actually, no, we, the, the town hall has a mailing machine, but I don't use that. I have a um, okay. imprint yeah, that we put directly on the, the newsletters that we send out, which is our biggest mailer. Okay. So whatever you print already is essentially already has it. Yep. Pretty ready to go. Okay. Um, do you do a lot of um, things that you would need layout space, like a table or a, bit, a large counter to work on that um, would require you to, you know, essentially have big, big space to kind of lay things out? I mean, I envision that happening. I don't believe that's really part of anything now, but in order to prep for different activities that we offer, if we have materials that we need to put together or whatever I can envision needing workspace like that. Okay. Um, what else inside the administration area might we, I mean, I'm assuming we'll have a staff bathroom and that sort yes, of thing. Yes, I did put that. Um, I'm, as far as going back to like, I know we're talking about administrative sort of area, but I envision having a lobby, like a, a, a way to greet people who are coming in, yep. having a, like an open receptionist desk there. Um, does, does one of the um, seniors man that desk pretty regularly? Is that sort of- There have been all, volunteers, yes. Volunteers, okay. Yeah. And typically, you know, from what I've seen and, and looked at, um, you know, you've got the administrative office pretty much adjacent to that lobby area. So you're overseeing essentially right. what's happening there. And then there's a nice sort of beyond the vestibule, there's a nice sort of welcoming area. With yes, like seating area. Space, yeah. Some soft seating. Yes. Yeah, okay. I actually thought of having a little area too where there could be you know, the coffee machine and whatnot. So when people come in, they can you know, it's, it's more of a welcoming area than just definitely cold. Yeah. Um, so going back to the administration, is there a need for a panic? You know, in terms of security, is there a need for a panic button um, that goes to dispatch or anything like that? I know we don't have that here now, um, being in a school building, but mm -hmm. um, I would certainly suggest that would be a good idea. Okay. Anything left in administration that we left out? So we have currently a little area that has a guest computer. If we need assistance from a volunteer to help, it's a computer that doesn't have passwords on it and you know just has basic sort of access. Um, I'd like to have something like that. And that can be close to the administrative, if not in the administrative area. Um, yeah, so I was thinking the, the potential for a future administrative assistant means that that space could be open. That's sort of the reception area for the administration yep. office suite. And that would probably would have the workstation for the admin assistant, but then this guest workstation could be in that same area. Perfect. Okay. Is 
So uh, moving on, to, uh, we talked about the vestibule in the lobby. Um, now, in terms of the other facilities here, um, do you have a breakdown of activities? Do you want spaces for act different activities or is this just a bunch of multi-purpose? Um, so I had things um, sort of spread out, not well, sort of with specific activities. Just to go back to that reception area though, we were thinking of having a coat closet somewhere where people can put clo coats, you know, if we can have a specific, I'm, I'm big on the storage space. Um, you know, so having some place where people can come in and take their coat or their umbrella and, you know, be able to put them away so that they're not carrying that around with them to different. Definitely. Yep. Yeah, the coats are actually an interesting dilemma. We do quite a bit of church design as well. And that's okay. always a, an interesting topic because um, security is a concern. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you leave your coat someplace, that's why a lot of people take their stuff with them because they don't want to leave it because it's out of their site. There's nobody actually manning the coat room to say, you have the right coat, ma'am, sir. Um, and some people are reticent about doing that and particularly if there's been an issue with that. Um, and so sometimes we do coat rooms and they never get used. <laughs> On the flip side, sometimes for those reasons, people don't put in a coat room and say, well, uh, we just expect people will just carry their coat around. And then you find out later on, they build the building and now there's all these coat racks, portable coat racks in the space. You go, oh my gosh, we talked about this. So it's a catch 22. It's hard to kind of figure out what might be in the place. And I'm and I don't fault you for, for saying you'd like a coat room because that's, you know, it's nice to be able to get rid of that weight and not have to transport it around and not have to track it. Um, I just bring it up as a possibility of concern to think about and, sure. and think about how we might put the, place a coat room in the space so that it's, it's less inviting for people, you know, for that type of an activity. Maybe there's, you know, it's off of a glass area that you can see in so you know if there's somebody in there, you know, there yeah, should be. Okay. Um, before we get to the activity rooms, the only other thing that I'm thinking of is to have two um, private consult rooms, both having um, like internet access and whatnot. We have our shine counselor, who's a, a person that comes in to meet with people one-to-one -to, -one to talk about um, their Medicare enrollment options. Um, they need to have privacy to be able to discuss that. If we have um, tax preparation as an option or you know, podiatry or nursing visit, something like that, I need private space for people to have these one-on-one -on -one consults. Um, so I was looking for two of those. Yeah. Is this uh, space, um, is this like a table and a couple of chairs or is it soft seating and sort of a one-on-one -on -one dialogue? Do they need writing space to fill they out? They would need the writing space. Yeah, yeah, they would need writing uh, space uh, or a space, you know, to have a laptop. Like when our shine counselor comes, I need to be able to have him um, have internet access, telephone, and be able to print. Um, I'm sure other different kinds of consultations might want that. Uh, I don't think it needs to be too big, but, you know, maybe enough for three or four people to sit in the room at sure. once. Um, with table and chairs, yeah. Mm -hmm. If I could, I'd like to request having like a little waiting area outside of those two consult rooms. That way, there's a seating area right there. So if you're, you know, you're next for your consult, you can sit and wait there. Makes sense. Um, moving on to more activity type areas. I wanted one large room and as Joyce was mentioning, we were, you know, my thought too was to have those dividers that can make the room really large or we can divide it and have, you know, multi-purpose and have more than one activity going on at a time. Yes. Um, or for that larger group that we have coming for whatever, we can expand it so that it's yep. one big room. Um, and typically along with the large room, you're gonna have tables and chairs. Yes. And um, what we would typically advise is that we determine whether or not we, um, you know, you, you're gonna have a storage room that goes yes. along with this for the tables and chairs. They've yes. gotta go someplace 
I don't like seeing it all stacked up in the back of the room. That's annoying. Me the rooms <laughs> um, so I think that um, the question is, do we want that storage room to be designed for 100% of the tables and chairs or something less than 100%? Um, in other words, is there times when you need every square foot of that whole space to be available for a game or an exercise or something that people are moving around? You don't want any tables and chairs in the space. I would say I'd like to have it completely clear. Okay. My vision, because I visited another location too um, and stole an idea from them. They have these two Olympic size ping pong tables wow. and it's a huge seller. Um, they have like competitions and, and stuff like that. So the, I'm kind of I'm kind of envisioning that would like to be able to store something like that as well. Um, in their storage space, they had their tables and chairs and those tables fit, the ping pong tables fit all in the same storage area. So they can um, put the, the ping pong tables and all of their table and chairs yeah. all in the one room. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it was, there was multiple doors to- Sure. To yeah, it's gonna be a big room. space. It was, okay. it was pretty big, but again, she could put everything away. Um, the other thing I'm thinking of for that particular large room is at one end to have um, a stage, not huge, um, but enough to rise up uh, so that entertainers or speakers or whatever can be seen by everyone in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of having them be on the same level, I'd like them to be up a little bit. So maybe up two steps? Two, yeah, two or three, nothing huge. Okay, um, yeah, I think... Two generally is about what I would recommend. Once you get beyond that, you know, you're going to have a ramp to get up there yep. for handicap accessibility. Yep. And you, that ramp starts to get pretty long when okay. you talk about going beyond two steps. Okay. And you said a small stage, but um, what sort of things do you envision happening on the stage? So I know, uh, I believe it was at the holiday party last year, they had it like a jazz trio. I think it was, Joyce might be able to um, pipe in about that, but I wanna say there was three musicians up on the stage. Um, would you say that was about right, Joyce? That, that is correct, there was three. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, um, at times if we're putting on programs and for balance and uh, other activities, we might want that person elevated and there may be people moving and right. demonstrating what they're trying to teach us. So I think we have to think of that also. Uh, we have had a balance person there and he was on the ground floor at the library and it wasn't really very um, helpful uh, when you would have to stand up to see what he was doing. So. I think the stage should perhaps be bigger for other activities that would need more room. Sure. So I know that they have had a program in the past with a theater company, like a traveling theater company. I mean, it doesn't need to be a high school stage, you know, in their right. auditorium, nothing like that, but certainly big enough to have a program. Right. So that, that, see. That, that helps, I think, in the envision. Okay. Thank you. Right. Um, what other activities would you want to happen in this in the large space so we can start to plan some storage for equipment and all the other things that need to go and find homes? Um, so the types of things I'd written down were obviously the entertainers, you know, if we had musicians or whatnot come. Um, so in terms, of, in, the mu in terms of music, um, uh, these groups bringing their own uh, PA equipment, or are they plugging into something that we've got speakers in the space set up already? And I think they plug great in if we had the option for them to plug into our speakers. Um, okay. If it can't be done, it can't be done. But if, if we're doing a wish list, well, we're not doing rock concerts. I, I, <laughs> right, there's no rock concerts. <laughs> so I think that whatever PA system we put in there will be sufficient, sufficient. for for at least vocal um, performance or a speaker. Um, if you've got a trio, a jazz trio, they may prefer to simply play acoustic in the space True. Um, and not be um, mic'd up right? Um, unless there's maybe somebody doing some speaking. So 
that I think it's you know it's not high powered amplifiers. It's, okay. it's enough to broadcast the sound evenly throughout the space so people can hear. Perfect. Yeah, um, I want to make sure the, people in the back can hear. Yeah, yeah, know? they'll be they'll be in ALS systems. So okay, you know we'll we'll that's required by code anyways. But you know that'll assist. But we want to make sure that the the acoustics are designed in a way that um, everybody's participating. Okay. Yeah, and I got to make sure that I keep the town hall employees working. They're going to hear all that fun action. <laughs> 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 so you're, you're advocating for a lot of sound proofing. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So in terms of AV, we're also going to want um, projection, I think, for video presentations. Yes. In this case, the screen idea may be required just because the size of this the video projection may be just too big for a TV. I mean, they yes. make them large now, 80, 90 inches, but still probably best bet to plan for a screen and projection. I think a projection screen would be better in this space. Okay. Other events and activities for this space? Um, so, was, you know, our large meals would be how, even smaller meals, you know, if I can do a, a luncheon on a regular basis, even though it's not, you know, 50 people coming, even if it's half that, I would want to use that space for that. Um, it says that we do round tables typically, you'd prefer that. And how many folks per table? Six? I would say six, yeah. Post COVID. <laughs> Yeah, right. I mean, that's <laughs> sort of a, real world. Yeah. that is that's sort of underlying the yeah. entirety of this discussion yeah. because it's it's changed everything. I know. Um, my thought is too because I want this space to be used for those, whether it's a regular, you know, daily, monthly thing, or these larger, um, you know, holiday type meals. I would like this room to be close to the kitchen in order to be able to, um, you know, pass through the meals easily. I don't want to be walking down a hall around the corner and, you know. Definitely. Do you envision that you'd need a, a serving area directly, you know, a window alcove or something to serve directly from the kitchen yes. into the space? So nobody's going through doors. It's right. Just the, the trays or food is pushed out. Right. I mean, if we could have a door as well, just in case, but, um, you know, my yeah, definitely is, an access door, sure. Yeah. But my right, thought is, yeah, most if of the food's coming food. out, or or there's going to be chafing dishes or things set up right. on this uh, serving area. When the room is split, I'm assuming it's split in half mm -hmm. with a folding partition. Does the serving area and the kitchen need to be accessible from both halves of the room? In other words, are you going to have an event that's going to need the kitchen? For both events at the same time, no. Okay. Um, here's a good question. What, what type of flooring material do you think is appropriate for this space? Uh, a laminate, an actual hardwood floor? Um, you know, the multi-purpose spaces are challenging mm -hmm. um, because some spaces want to be carpeted for the type of event that you're having. Some spaces want to have a, a resilient floor or a wood floor, um, you know, and for certain activities, some spaces want to be a fitness floor, like a rubber floor uh, for what you're doing there. So you can't obviously change the floor out uh, for each event. So um, many of the spaces I've seen have used a resilient, like a VCT vinyl, floor tile. That's what or, I would. Uh, or a hardwood. Like a, I mean, if it could look like wood, I mean, that's the, you know, but something that's going to be. Uh, they're durable. They're fairly yeah. easy to maintain. They, right. they take a lot of traffic right. um, and they don't dent. Um, yeah. Well, moving the tables and chairs around and whatnot and stuff. Yeah. I just, I want it to be durable, but look nice. I, I want to avoid carpet at all costs in that room. Yeah. Um, act activities like um, you had mentioned the uh, fitness um, balance type things. Um, I'm assuming there's going to be some need for uh, storage of 
that equipment, there's not much of it, but you know, if there's any sort of um, stuff that people use during that, if it's, you know, the jump ropes or other types of um, things that need to be stored, uh, many times those end up just stuck on a wall rack in the corner of the room and that's sort of junky. So I'd like yeah. to have a storage space for that equipment as well. Anything else in this large space that we've um, neglected? Not for me. Those were kind of the main points that I thought of for that space. Okay. Does the, when we split it into two spaces, um, there'll be an access to, to get to both halves from, you know, this main welcoming reception lobby. Um, and because likely due to the size of the space, there's going to need to be a separate egress by code mm -hmm. um, because they'll probably need two means of egress from each side of this large space. Yep. Do we need a separate access directly into the space, you know, that bypasses the central lobby area from the outside? Um, is there any need for people to be able to go directly into the space? Clearly there'll be, an, like I just mentioned, there'll be an actual door that is required for exiting so if you needed a vendor to come in to set up something, they could prop that door open and get into the space that way. I'm thinking more about regular folks driving up and wanting to be able to get into the space somehow. Um, you'd always want them to go through. I would always want them to go through, yeah. There will eventually be hopefully like a check-in process. Um, yeah. So I would rather not have people be able to access from the outside, just simply through the front door. Okay, and back, this goes, Hand in hand, the same question I just asked, but back to the security side of things on that. Do you need a request to exit button? So you, people can't leave the facility without pushing a button somewhere. You'll see these a lot on, um, on um, uh, assisted living places um, where people that may have issues you don't want them to be able to wander out of the room. I, I mean, this is this is not that type of facility, but I have seen them on a few um, um, senior centers. And so I'm just curious. I haven't thought about that. Is, do you have a thought on that, Tracy? Can it just be like an emergency exit? Or can we just label it like emergency exit only? I can't imagine there's gonna be people who are just gonna. No, I mean, typically this is something that, you know, you just, you wouldn't want somebody to be able to leave on their own. Um, in an emergency, of course, you know, fire alarm was pulled, the door would be open and people would be free to go. But just for regular business hours, you know, essentially it's for folks with dementia and other types of mental difficulties. I, know that. I don't think we need that. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So beyond the large space, um, other activity rooms that are smaller? Yeah. So I'm thinking of other rooms. Um for things like exercise classes on a smaller scale, um, a painting class. So that room would need to have, you know, facilities to be able to clean brushes and paint and that kind of thing. So they'd need to have a sink in there. Um, I'd love an area to be able to have almost like a computer room with laptops um, to offer to people to come in if they don't have computer or internet access at home, they can come, you know, use it to do Zoom or you know whatever other things they need to use a computer for. Uh, so I want to have uh, space like that. Um, you know, different types. Of, you know, I might have. And there's so many different thoughts, but that haven't been put into play yet. So I know you know there's definitely definitely there's different ideas, and I would like to have things going on at at the same time. So I don't want to have just one activity room where this is what we're offering today and this is it. I want to be able to offer multiple areas. Another area I would like is like a small sitting area with comfortable chairs, maybe like a little almost like a reading nook kind of a corner where it's quiet but comfortable and people can come and go. Uh, not necessarily a scheduled activity is going on, but they can feel free to gather there. Sure. Um, I'd like to have a little area like that. Maybe there's a television on that wall if they just wanted to come in and, you know, watch a movie with a friend or watch the news or whatever it is. I just, you know, to have a little area with 
mm -hmm. like a meeting area, but with comfortable seating. Uh, you had mentioned the exercise classes had small extra, you know, a smaller space for that. Um, how many people do you think that might hold a class like that? Maybe 20 people. 20 people. At one time, maybe 15. Okay. Uh, same thing for some of these other spaces, like an art room. Right. 15 to 20 people, computer yeah. room, similar size spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for the computer room, should we plan that there are sort of long, large tables for people to set up a laptop at? But you had mentioned Zoom, so that's hard to do, as you know. Um, from yeah. you know, There's others doing things in that space. So should we have, like, um, I'm trying to think of a way to do that. You can't really do it in the same space. So you'd almost have, like, you know, a breakout space to go if you want to do a video conference, a video chat room or two like little video chat um, cubbies almost yep. um, that could, that people could do that. If they didn't have the equipment at home, they could come here and, and there'd be a, a space that's quieter, uh, but that also has the you know appropriate technology, but also a background, you know, that would be conducive. <laughs> right. So, okay, that makes sense. Um, and then, um, and I think I understand the other things. Is it important to have um, a space that you could, you know, set up as a movie watching space strictly, or is this sort of doing dual purpose with the sitting area? Uh, I would say dual purpose, you know, just a, a welcoming, comfortable place for people to sit and chat with a friend, or again, if they wanted to throw on the TV, it's there as an option, uh, but not a specific movie view. I mean, if we were going to show a big movie, we would do it in that big. In the large room. room. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other activities, spaces? Um, the, the art space is definitely something, you know, I'm thinking in terms of how, what, what I potentially could do as far as the program, but I think the art space is a dedicated space that's gonna yes. have all the supplies, it's gonna have the- Storage the area. And the storage, yeah. and all, you know, everything's gonna be set up for art. So that's always gonna be art. And then the uh, sitting area, computer room, and exercise space don't necessarily um, have to always be static. You know, in the life of this facility, you may want to change things up, and new right. things may come down the road. So these rooms could almost be interchangeable. Just yeah, more multi furniture you put in there, and you know, as long as we provide storage for each one of these spaces you can repurpose them for something else. Right. Um, you know, if, if some activity takes off and you need multiple rooms to accommodate it, then you've got the ability to, to change things up. Right, I agree. Okay. The only other activity space I was thinking of is something outdoors is to have some kind of outdoor space, whether it's a patio with tables and chairs or many um, COAs throughout the summer had a like a tent outside to be able to do an activity outside, separate each other, you know, from each other. And um, even outside of COVID, I'd love to have an outdoor space. I think it would be great off of that. Yeah. Um, gardening, is that? That'd be great. That? Yep. Yeah, okay. Because that's going to require supplies and you know a utility sink of some sort and hoses. Um, the kitchen uh, probably should focus in on what it should contain and what its purpose is. Mm -hmm. um, is the kitchen going to be for creating meals from scratch or is it a okay? So, yes, right so that can be part of it. Um, there was a, um, a visiting chef program here that I would love to get back into play, uh, having someone come and prepare meal again for maybe it's a small group of 15 to 20. You know, if it grows, that's great. But that person would come in and, and make something 
Um, they may wanna do it from scratch. They may bring it in and just warm it up, but I want the option to make things right there on the premises. So the, the equipment will be sort of professional grade right. um, kitchen equipment with a hood and you know fire suppression system. They'll have a prep sink <clears throat> as well as a hand washing sink by local plumbing um, health codes, um, refrigerator and freezer space in the kitchen. But I'm assuming there's no need for any sort of walk-ins. This is minimal. No, no walk-ins. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but the kitchen itself, the design of the kitchen is going to have to accommodate a group of 15 to 20 people as sort of a teaching style layout. So there'll be a place for everybody to sort of gather back and watch somebody doing the preparation. Yes. Um, is this set up like a class where people are going to be actively participating in cooking or is this simply a demonstration type learning environment? Um, I hadn't really thought that through. I, I love the idea of the demonstration. If it can be hands-on and they can do something, that'd be great. But um... mm -hmm. It has more to do with, you know, for, for my purposes, has more to do with providing enough counter space and providing yeah. enough storage space so that you can have 15 to 20 sets of bowls and spatulas right. and, you know, measuring equipment and all the other gear that you would need to have space. It also means that we might want, you know, the range that's uh, the ovens and, and ranges that are there might have to be a little larger to accommodate more pots and right. pans being heated up. If you've got 10 people all making stuff at the same time. True. Um, and maybe those types of classes we would just limit, you know, to a first come first serve limited number of people at a time, you know, mm -hmm. obviously I can't have 20 people in a kitchen, you know, in a cooking class, but I could limit right. that to. Yeah, this five. is where that, as I said before, this is where when we do a first draft, you'll take a look at it and you will, you'll either trace will fall off her chair. Right. <laughs> we'll say, like, Wait a minute, this thing is way too big. We've got to rein it back in. And so yeah. we'll, we'll look at it and say, okay, you it was nice what we thought of would be really great, but that's probably not, not what gonna we're work, gonna right. need. And so we'll we'll come up with a way to do it in a different way. But I think until you see the diagrams and really start seeing how things are looking, it's hard to imagine what the implications might be. Okay. Um, so once you get the first draft, I think we'll have the opportunity to then revisit these same discussions. Okay. Um, did you mention dishwasher? when you were talking about the appliances? No, I hadn't gotten there yet. Okay. Um, what kind of a dishwasher? There's, if you're familiar with commercial kitchens, there's different kinds. Um, so I'm curious what you have to say. So, I mean, I'd love like an industrial dishwasher because I think it would be. So the true countertop yeah, model, like 30 the second. Between, like you push through, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Well, if you're dealing with potential of dinners for 50 to 100 people, that's, you're, you're going to want right. that. Right. Yeah. Makes, so you don't have to stay all night washing dishes. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not. Done. <laughs> <laughs> um, I um, did want to request a delivery door access directly to the kitchen, um, you know, for food delivery. What about um, storage, like a pantry yes. for canned goods and other things like that, a large yeah. pantry for that supplies, as well as, um, I'm gonna call it China, but we know it's not gonna actually be China, um, for plates, dishes, yes. or cups, glasses. Yes. Is there a separate area or a special area that's needed for tea and coffee? In addition, obviously, the coffee station at the entry lobby, but. Yeah. Within the kitchen area, often you're going to be making coffee for you know a lot of people, right? And um, so there's going to have to be a coffee station set up, right? Um, but will you end up having teas as well? Um, I would think so. Yes. Okay, so a whole separate area for that too.
Um, anything else on the kitchen that anybody else really I mean, anybody can think of? Sure, Joyce. Um, I know that uh, the Buddha directs is, directors have talked main, um, many times about having a kitchen that we could serve food to the community on a daily basis. Uh, we think it's very like enriching uh, and good for people to socialize over a meal. And uh, I'm not sure if we even mentioned this to Cindy, but we were hoping to have, um, just like uh, Merrimack does and Georgetown does when uh, pre-pandemic, they were actually feeding the seniors you pay. Mm -hmm. uh, I know some meals, uh, some centers charge 250 a meal, some charge three but they can even call and order it or they can call and do a grab and go. But I think it's important. And uh, we could see what the others have to say about having um, meal service on a daily basis once we get up and running in our new location. I, I myself personally think it's a great thing. It's great for socializing. It's good to make sure people have an appetite and get a chance to have a meal and eating with other people. Socializing, and, yeah. Oh yes, I would love yeah. to go myself. The, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's a great <laughs> idea. Who, who are table. the one? Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. What were oh, we gonna say? Done, Jeff. That's just one thought I have. Mm -hmm. And another thought um, while I'm in speaking is at some point, if this does grow like we think it will with a much more welcoming building and, uh, and more people will be coming. In the future, we might need another outreach worker mm -hmm. uh, as we grow. So I don't know if we could use the same office and they wear headphones and whatever, how that would work. But I think that's something we might see down the road. Yeah, so Cindy, you had mentioned um, the potential growth for an assistant director and a community liaison and an admin assistant. Um, would any of those folks take pressure off the current outreach director that would allow that person to do what Joyce is saying without needing a separate seconds outreach coordinator or is it so really- So the outreach coordinator right now is part-time. So yeah. whether it could be a job share type position where there's two part-time and they share the same office space mm -hmm. um, or that part-timer goes full-time. I mean, there's, I think there's ways to play with it. Okay. That's good. Oh, thank you. Yeah, those are good suggestions. And that raises an important point. The other staff members are, is everybody else full-time or is the other program coordinator, is that part-time? Uh, no, the pro program coordinator myself are both 32 hours a week. So we'd be okay. there all day. All right. Um, in terms of the daily serving program, um, who would the, the who would work the kitchen? Is it other seniors that would volunteer and work the kitchen? Okay. Um, and that's my question because in different communities, and I'm not sure how they, I think they've used both models in Merrimack once where they got, where they get their food from, it's distributed from, I don't know if it's elder services or who, who provides yeah, the grab and go meals that you're talking about. The grab and about. go, yeah. but the, they used to deliver to West Newbury and Merrimack hot meals. You, you'd get a number of how many people were going to attend. And then it might have come from Lawrence, from one of the regional schools or something. I don't know the details, but they did that. And then I think Merrimack may have switched to a model where they prepared the food in-house. So I know both are definitely options. So you'd probably need to know which you'd be right. doing for Merrimack, just work. Uh, we visited there and it is in-house. It have, is in-house now. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I'm not sure about uh, Georgetown. Do they serve full meals on a daily basis, Cindy, when you were there? Uh, well, obviously right now, no, but um, she oh, had, the kitchen she had set up really had more of a warming oven. Um, she did have a, a stove, but it was more about warming things up than preparing. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I think they have the option, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to do either. Yeah. Okay. I, I know this is a big undertaking, uh, but as time goes on, I, I think it would be a great thing for us to provide. Yeah. Mm. Well, based on what 
everyone's described for the kitchen, um, you know, the potential for 15 people to be in there at one time, you'd certainly have the size necessary to do either. The question is for Joyce, for your plan of potentially serving meals, the question is more about number of appliances, spacing those appliances out that you can have, you know, I mean, how many folks do you think would actually be in there cooking six to eight people potentially actively oh, cooking meals? No, I don't think it would take that many. Um, I think um, some kitchen chefs, uh, it's usually one and maybe some, um, I don't really know. Yeah, I'm just thinking if you're working on a daily basis, in as much as you like being a volunteer, no. you're going to get burned <laughs> out pretty quick. So I just yeah. assumed a group of people would take this on as their volunteer opportunity and they'd trade off who's Oh, I know. My sister does that in Salem and she does that, not now naturally, but she does that for tax relief. Sure. And uh, she helps serve the food and uh, and but I got the understanding was only one chef in the actual kitchen hmm. uh, preparing the food, and then the, the tax uh, people were the ones that were serving and doing the rest. Yeah, so but that would be a good question because if the folks cooking are not paid employees, they're volunteers, and I mean you may have one person that really loves it, but that probably that person's probably not going to be there for decades. Um, so you'd have to re keep finding new people interested in becoming the, the chef on the daily. Oh, show. no, that would be a paid position. Yeah, that's you. what I was getting at. I'm thinking yeah. that the person Ooh. cooking it may end up having becoming almost by default, even if you started out wanting it to be volunteer, but but eventually probably would migrate. To yes, it. it would start out as paid, but I'm sure. I don't think anybody would want to take that on the volunteer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So that's a different thing. If there's, you know, if in both models with the the senior center programming being such that there's a chef demonstrating to a group of people, and in the meals program there's a chef cooking. Okay. The kitchen's going to be set up for basically one to two people doing the cooking, so that the appliances and all the equipment are set up for that. The space itself might be large enough to house 15 people, but the rest of the folks are just observing or they're helping to shuttle food out into the large meeting space, you know, where the people are set up at tables, they're essentially serving servers at that point. Um, so that's important information. Um, I think we have to look uh, into it a little further and to see what is required. Um, and I think that would be accessible to us by contacting the others that do serve food. Um, what yeah. type of kitchens they have, what type of help they need. Mm -hmm. I'm putting it in your corner, Jeff. Jeff. <laughs> well, I will certainly tell you how big a space you need. Um, <laughs> and that'll get the ball started rolling. Right. And uh, and then we'll, we'll see where it takes us from there. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Jeff, I have a question. Um, on one, uh, on s several of the um, senior centers that I visited, the um, and I know we've discussed the um, the entrance, uh, the reception area. Um, there were some that you just wanted to walk out again, and there were others that were very inviting, and you wanted to step further in to see what was happening. Um, I also see that um, entrance area as a resource center for um, say the son or the daughter of an elderly person that may need information. Uh, they may not know where to go for this or that for their um, needs of their elder. And so I, I would like to see like a resource center. Um, it could be something as simple as a brochure um, holder on the wall but uh do you get what i'm getting at here sure, certainly yeah and i it's sort of to go back on the point you made about um inviting you know my from an architect's point of view my perspective is you want to continue to show people um sort of unveil the building like a movie you kind of want to be able to walk in a little bit you know, first of all, when most people go to a space they haven't been at, 
they're, they don't know what to expect. So they don't want to have too much confrontation coming mm -hmm. into the building. They want to be able to see ahead of what's to come and be able to understand that they're allowed to go there, but they're not going to be confronted um, with some, you know, unforeseen or unknown situation. So the receptionist desk is great, but having a glass entry vestibule, glass doors that you can kind of see where you're headed before you get there. And then once you're in that reception space, then having view corridors to different activity rooms or down to the large meeting space where you can kind of see what's ahead and you don't have to commit to going there, but you can kind of check it out from a distance and say, maybe I might be interested in going there. The, the ability to really look and look around and kind of experience what's, what's happening before you jump in is important for first time visitors, but it also helps draw you into those spaces because you can see things happen. You can see there's the art room or there's an event happening at the large meeting space. There's an exercise group working uh, in the building, but then you also, if you're coming there, like you said, for resources for your family members, you know, there, there's things that are right there that don't have to take up a lot of space, a brochure rack, or maybe the, um, uh, the, the little consult rooms are off of an alcove. You can get there and you know kind of how to go. But I think there's ways to design a building like this that, um, and they've been done successfully before you've seen them, um, that sort of just uh, allow you to experience the building without having to jump right into it and it just get you know hit over the head or that hide everything away behind doors you can't see through and then you don't know what's out there you don't even know what's happening in the building it's almost like you have to be joining the secret club to know what there is to do there um, so it's a great design exercise um, and it will be fun to, when we get to that point so some i appreciate of the, it. Um, yeah some of um the elderly even at one um place uh, even had a um, spot where, like if they knitted um, baby sweaters, they could display those and they were actually for sale. Um, so some of their crafts were, um, were able to be viewed um, for sale to the public, I guess, or to anyone that, um, and I don't know that that's necessary, but I'm just, I was thinking about it and thinking what a good idea it was. Yeah, I mean, a big component of, of a senior center is sort of personalization of the building and being able to have the folks that are of the community know that this sort of being cared for, being invested in and, and being used by other members of the community so that it's not, you know, you don't go there and you assume it's just any old building and just, you know, a collection of spaces where you can do stuff there, but the, there's art on the wall, there's crafts that are there displayed, um, you know, lots of different things that personalize it to the folks that are living in the community. And we have an excellent uh, food pantry in town. So um, this may not be necessary, but uh, one uh, place we went to, um, if elders needed food, they could come in quietly and they would be bags of food um, that a volunteer would prepare, prepare for them and they could just walk out with a bag of food. Um, again, that may be something that could be incorporated in a, in a different area. Um, I'm not sure, but that's just, I'm just throwing that out. But I would like to go back to your opening statement. Um, you said you were, um, your, job was to design this for the existing town hall. And well, I thought uh, the, let me clarify, because I okay. think that I may have overstepped something. All there. Right. I think the, the concept of this came up when we were considering, um, when Tracy was considering, you know, the this town hall re, um, renovation project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm not certain from my own position, because I just I'm not plugged into it, whether the town's decided what is happening with counseling on aging. I think they know that they have the project at town hall, but they haven't really decided how to handle this piece of it. And does it go here? Does it go with town hall or does it go somewhere else? I think that's still a valid, an open question. Well, I guess my question is the work that you'll be doing, Jeff, 
if this doesn't work out for town hall, can we take what you're doing and move it somewhere else if we need to? That's a really important um, piece of information to understand. And that is the basis of this study here is meant to not exist anywhere in town. This is an, an idealized um, conceptual uh, analysis of the space requirements. So all okay. we're going to be doing at the end of this is saying, um, we looked at all the space needs of Council of Aging. We found out that I'm going to pick a number out of the sky. You know, you need 15,000 square feet of space, roughly. And I'm not saying this report or, or study isn't saying it has to go any one specific location, but we're giving the town and the Council of Aging folks the ability to then say, okay, now we know how much space we need. Now is, this, is the step where we have to determine where is it going to go. And now that we know how much we need, we have a better understanding of where it could fit. Okay. So it, it, we might come up with this and say, you know, you only need a certain amount of space that could fit in any one of these dozen locations, or you need so much space, there's really only two locations in town that are ideal for it. So the next step after this is, is sort of figuring out where does it go? Um, but you don't really understand, you can't really answer the where does it go question until you, you know exactly what your need is. Okay, thank you. Sir. Can I just go back to the entry area? Because there are a couple of points that I wanted to make sure that we covered. One of which was making sure there's parking near the front entrance mm -hmm. uh, to the building. Secondly, I was hoping for an overhang over the front door uh, covered so that uh, protect from weather. Off area. Yeah. Um, and then for the, if there needs to be a ramp into the entry door, uh, that it would be covered again Got for it. safety. Not having to shovel it and have someone slip and fall and whatnot. So That's sort of my. Yeah. I mean, these days, the ideal scenario for a senior center is to have everything all one. on one level, no ramps, no lifts, if Good. you can avoid it, you know, to do to do all of that. I mean, I have seen senior centers with elevators because there's, you know, they're big enough that they have two stories, but um, ideally you could do it on one level and you have, you can avoid having to maintain lifts and elevators and ramps and deal with all that. Right, okay. And then the other thing was to make sure the entry door would be automated so that and I would almost like that on um, restroom doors if possible too, so that you know someone who uses a cane or a walker, not having to have to struggle with opening a door, um, you know, to get in or out. Sure. All the handicapped accessibility issues have to be incorporated. Anyway. Yeah, we would have normally done with handicap accessibility. The but the key here is that um, for the, the push button, the mm -hmm. door openers. Um, in some situations, they're not required, but they're preferential. And um, so it's important that you brought it up. I think it probably would have been done anyways. Um, so, you know, that's always something that as the design part of the project would continue and in, even into construction that there'd be options you can look at for that, um, you know, from the standard single door button, you know, it opens to potentially a sliding door, um, like you'd see at a shopping sure. store or something like that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, is there any uh, maintenance facilities that need to be part of this building? I mean, obviously we're, we talked about we're gonna have a janitor's closet um, so they can be maintained, but um, trash room, recycling area, um, sort of a buildings and grounds, caretaking type room that has the bags of sand and salt and the shovels and hoses and all the other stuff that goes with maintaining a building. I would say that's a, a wise okay. uh, move. And Tracy, so, the, there would be no, there's no other town department as far as I know that would maintain, uh, does, does the town maintain separately? The, the DPW does maintain for the, um, the we've kind of gone back and forth. We've used outside services. We've used our DPW. But when we get back to our um, 
or civic center complex for lack of a better term, I, I think DPW will be taking on all of the um, the cleaning and the maintenance and as they did before we moved. Yeah, on the exterior. Interior as well. They do oh, they all would, the recycling, the, the garbage. Yeah, they do all that, the cleaning. Great. I was just, that's why I was just looking at our space, the your space design for town hall to see if we had incorporated that in and I, I'm not seeing it. Yeah, I think it was one of those things where it never existed and so it didn't make it. Right, <laughs> right. But I want to make sure we, you know, that it is it is important. Um, we'll, typically we'll have a set of rooms for things like boiler room, electric yep. room, you know, yep. those types of spaces. But then we'll also have the buildings and grounds, the janitors, the trash and recycling, and then what I tend to call like a housekeeping or, um, general building storage room where you put the paper towels and the toilet paper sure. and all the other stuff you've got to store but doesn't always have a good home for. Um, right. So, you know, just a room with a lot of shelves in it. Really. Boy, things are evolving. All of us ladies and none of us thought about the cleaning products. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Yeah. I appreciate it. That's my job, I think. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, since we're down to this at this point, I can't imagine we've forgotten anything. But I will ask again if anybody has anything that we that they can think of that we you haven't heard talked about yet as part of the facility. Alicia, I don't know if you have anything to say, but just so you know, you're on mute. I know you're on your phone. You might not be able to tell. No. Oh. Okay. I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening and it's very interesting. Um, I think you guys are doing a great, great job. Right. Anyone else? Sandy? Hi. Um, two things I, I think of, and we hadn't discussed it as a group, but I'm thinking of it as a possibility is perhaps if we're concerned about um, people's belongings when they came in, would it be possible to think about, and you know, I'm just throwing this out, a, a, a locker area where people could, you know, grab a locker and grab their key and, you know, put their personal things in there. Maybe just something to think about. And the second thing is I noticed when we went to Merrimack, I don't remember seeing it in the other locations, but there was a, um, and this is like a defibrillator, you know, oh, yeah. you, don't, you don't like to think you need it, but no, I, I, I <laughs> that kind of thing, is there a, like a location you could have something like that? So yeah, that, um, we, will, we, we would put in several of them in a facility like this. Okay. Yeah. Um, typically, the, the similar things, you know, it's not just because it's a senior center, but we, we, we do them in other buildings too, um, because you, you can never tell and there are plenty of young people that have issues too. So um, you just want them available, but you also want people to be trained on how to use them. Right. So um, typically we would decide on the locations and then provide the container, the box that the thing lives in. And then the actual users the town would actually buy and provide and maintain the devices so they could be able to then decide, you know, do we have the proper staff properly trained to use it and then, you know, provide the device so they provide the training and the device at the same time. That way, you know, that's really effective. You know, we're not just sticking it in there and then nobody knows how to use it and then something happens. Oh, absolutely. There's that thing on the wall and we don't know what to do. So we, we did yeah, that's have a, as part of a grant, we, we were um, awarded funding and also the Sunman family donated um, a number of them to us and, and we had them at town hall and we have monthly managers meetings or periodic now managers meetings. And part of our annual um, training comes from the fire department and how to use them. So we do it every year. So, Good. so if we ever need them, hopefully not, but if we ever need them, we can certainly take advantage of them. Yeah, and um, I, I thought your idea of the lockers seemed to be a, a good idea, and I, but it's also something, you know, if we put it in 
near the coat room or in the coat room. Um, it's certainly something that could be continued to be discussed as your group goes through the process. You can, you know, a lot of these things, like I said before, a lot of these things are going to be new things to think about, new things to discuss that you hadn't previously planned on discussing little details like this. And so as they come up, you know, you should just keep it on a list going and, and repeatedly discuss it until you've all decided on a direction. And, you know, lockers, they're relatively inexpensive. They don't take up a lot of space. So it's not something that, you know, if we didn't decide now, you could never go and, and add it later. Um, but it's a good, good discussion point. Thank you. Great. Jeff, could you talk a little bit about next steps, how it evolves from here for everyone? Sure. So my next step is to take everything that you've just said and create a document like I explained before. Um, it's going to take us a little while to put the document together, um, you know, maybe a couple of weeks. And then uh, I'd prefer to email that document out to everyone, or at least to through Tracy to everyone. And um, it's going to be rough, um, you know, in, in the sense that it'll look finished, but there'll be things that I heard that maybe you disagree with or that I misheard um, or that we should continue to talk about. And so we'll, it'll be labeled a first draft. And we will have to have another discussion just like this after you've had a chance to review it and write in any questions you have or send me an email with any questions you have. And then we'll go through all your questions on the first draft. Um, if we need to, we can go space by space, but you know, um, it can be as long or as short as you need and go through everything. And then that will allow us to, to hone in more precisely on what each space needs to have inside of it and what it needs to look like, how big is it, and whether there's anything missing. Um, so I'll do the, after that meeting, I'll do the whole same process over again. I'll take the draft, I'll make all the edits that we had talked about, update it so it becomes the second draft. I'll then send it back out again. And um, you know, at that point, we can continue to iterate this process, keep going draft after draft until we get it to a final point at which everybody's comfortable we've captured the space needs. Um, you know, and so we can go as many rounds as we need to, but hopefully we won't need to go too many rounds before we've gotten there. And then we'll finalize it. And um, and I don't know at what point, Tracy, you want to involve um, the select board in any presentations, but I think, you know, at some point the select board would want a presentation as to the process we've gone through, how we started and where we ended up um, so that they, they know, um, you know, we've completed this step. And then beyond that point, we, um, you know, the next step, which, you know, can be a follow on task is to then start thinking about where this facility goes. Um, and once some locations are identified, we could be engaged to create um, uh, what we call test fit diagrams. You know, we could take a site uh, wherever it happens to be. And now that we know how big the building is, we could sort of draw a little concept sketch of how the building might fit on the site, where the parking goes, where the building goes, just to confirm that yes, and in fact, it fits on the site that you're thinking of and it generally, it works correctly, that the cars can come in and out, you can have a space for the amount of cars you need to park there. And also the building generally fits well on the site. It meets the zoning requirements and wouldn't be a burdensome thing to construct. Um, <clears throat> and that could be looked at for multiple sites. It doesn't have to be just one. And then beyond that, of course, we'd start the whole design of the facility and then construction and you know, eventually occupation. So um, this is just the very first step of a long process, um, but, but you can kind of see how it would evolve from there. And in terms of bringing it forward to a presentation to the select board, I think that doesn't happen until the expansion committee has finalized that that draft work to say, okay, this this is what we need. And then at that point, I, th I think it would be appropriate to move it to the select board. Sure. Makes sense. And then we'll have capital planning committee and finance committee and town meeting. And it is 
quite a lengthy process. Yes, it can be. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy, do you have a question? Yes, I do. I was just wondering, so when you develop, um, when you develop this needs assessment that do you take any outside, like say town st statistics and information from other towns and um, are you just taking information from us? How do you compile what we actually need? Just so, from us or do you look um, what others have done or how does yeah, this come we, about? We do look at some comparables, um, you know, and other towns have done. You had mentioned a few that you've gone to see. Um, you know, in our programming process, a, a lot of it is about what's unique specifically to what your needs are. But when you, we deal with a client that, you know, because of their current circumstances or because it's a new thing, they don't really know what they need, then a lot more has to come from us and what we've seen and what we think works well um, in our experience. Now, my firm hasn't designed a lot of senior center projects before. So um, what we'll be doing is looking at um, other projects that we know about and, and investigating them. Um, we do have, uh, I know another architect that does senior centers and so we can always um, have conversations with them about them. They're not challenging facilities to do, we just don't regularly do them. Um, so I, I think that the key is that we do as much information gathering as we can in this first stage. And you guys have already done a good amount of it by knowing what other towns are doing. But that's one of my aspects of what I'm going to be doing is researching some other facilities and um, seeing what else is out there. Can I suggest you look at, um, oh, sorry, Tracy, I was gonna say, can I suggest you specifically look at Newburyport? Just, that's one that I went to. And again, that storage space was awesome. She had just like her layout is welcoming and warm. I mean, it's, it's like a country club, it's massive, but um, if I'm looking for an ideal, I mean, that's a great, that's a great. And that's a newer center as well. So that, that's. Uh, Mer Merrimack is wonderful too. It really is. Yeah. It is. And Jeff, also um, Martha Taylor can provide you with our population and demographics and all that information too, if that is helpful. As yeah. As the population and projections. Yeah, it, it is. It is. And it's helpful. I mean, it's sort of more of an anecdotal way because right. uh, you cannot, you can't really uh, expect that the number of the population numbers um, will directly result in how many folks will take advantage of right. the senior center. Right. <laughs> um, but our senior population is growing. Yeah. So, you know. And that's, that's happening everywhere too. And that's, right. big. that's big. So, and then I and, if I can just interject with that too. Um, my thought process is to make programs that may, maybe aren't just for, you know, elder, the senior population in the, in the community. Maybe a, a program that we throw out there with a speaker, adult children who have an elderly parent that maybe doesn't live in Newbury wants to come and learn about whatever it is that we're, we're talking about. So, yeah. um, you know, in terms of having programs that are gonna sort of, it's not just for the seniors. On an everyday basis, it would be obviously, but you know, when we have these bigger programs, obviously we wanna open it up to the community. So it's just a thing. And I was just going to say, I've seen a lot of senior centers because in my other projects that we do, <laughs> we're often presenting to the public in a senior center, um, you know, because of that, that's the community meeting space that's available that night. And so, you know, I walk around and I look at the building and see how it was designed and, and I have a good feeling for what's out there because I've probably seen several dozen senior centers just, just because I've been in them presenting for some other, you know, project. And, um, wow. and that, you know, that's an interesting way to experience them. Um, but that, your point is well taken. They, they are a good community resource that serves the whole town. So, um, any other questions people might have? I, I do, Jeff. This is Alicia. And actually, it's a question for Joyce, Evelyn, and Sandy. Have you guys um, asked 
in any of your endeavors when you um, research um, townsfolk and what they're interested in has 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 like joining with the, another town like when Newburyport is so new um, has regionalization ever been brought up and has it been shot down um, I know with the school is regionalized and it, it comes with its own challenges and that, and um, and I'm not saying that that we should regionalize but I just I was wondering if that has ever um, come up at all we have discussed it um, and we were given a couple of leads um, but nothing materialized um, so I would say we've discussed it but we haven't explored it till it uh, till the end of the earth either it's been looked at but that's all yeah um i don't necessarily think it's a good fit for newberry um but i just want to be prepared for when that question comes up um and it may even come up on the town on the town meeting floor like have you looked into regionalizing what why are we spending this amount of money on uh you know our own needs have, have you looked outside of newberry and and i, and I know I'll, I'll have an answer for that because just what Tracy said, we have an aging population. I expect it to, to grow. Um, I don't necessarily, I don't think that regionalizing, regionalizing our council on aging would benefit the town of Newberry. I think it would hinder it. So uh, I'm not a proponent of that, but I want to be prepared um, for when that, when that comes up. I didn't know if you had heard anything from your, um, Council on Aging attendees, you know, people that use the program, if they, if that's ever come up. The, um, most of our work was um, as far as exploring um, regionalization uh, was kind of um, shut down with COVID. Um, we come to an abrupt stop. We had other plans to look into other things, but uh, and never materialized, but we as a group can start um, looking at that again if if um, you'd like us to. Well, do you think it's worth worthwhile? I mean, I don't want to do the work. Do you think? Do you think there's and there's any way we can find out if there's a lot of our residents that use the new report facility? Because if we were to regionalize, I would would think it would be with them, but that's just a wild guess on my on my part. I personally don't think um, the majority of our people would venture there. They would uh, they would for special events. Um, that's okay. just my personal opinion. Yeah, okay. And what about you, Joyce? Have you heard any grumblings or anything? I have uh, not, and I really don't think Newburyport would want to join with us. Well, then uh, there's that piece of it, too. Yes, that, I don't think that would be something I would uh, even think about. Um, the only community that's nearby that came in discussion was Raleigh. And I personally feel that I didn't like the idea of regionalization, that we should stay on our own. Uh, and we did discuss it as a group, but like Evelyn says, we didn't get to visit Raleigh or talk anything about it. And meanwhile, their um, director, I believe, has left. Uh, um, yeah. Yes, I think she maybe moved over. I think I saw her recently. Is she over in Georgetown now or someplace? Merrimack, yep. Merrimack, oh, that's yeah. where but they do have. So, they do have a new director. Um, yes. new director. Yeah, Merrimack. So, so I think we should leave everything just as it is and uh, uh, we'll just answer the questions that come on it and um, would just say the, the truth, the pandemic had held us up from researching that further and having meetings with anybody on it. Alicia, okay. 
Alicia, uh, um, I yeah, I just want to comment. I think that we um, we have a problem, uh, not a problem, um, with Raleigh. I mean, um, Plum Island, Old Town, and Byfield. It, that is um, bringing those three regions together is going to be um, challenging. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think that we should regionalize. I don't think we'll achieve anything from it, but I just want to be ready in case that that comes up. I want to say, yep, yeah, we've looked at it and we, we haven't, we've, we've decided, you know, because of X, Y, and Z that it is not a good fit for us. Sounds good to me. Okay. Is there any other, and maybe this is a question for Cindy. Is there any, um, excuse me, we're going to stay on 84 West Hartford. Okay. Um, so is there any, is there any um, communities around us that regionalize? Is this even done? Not that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, and I, I would think, uh, to yeah. speak to the regionalization piece of like people coming from Newberry to Newburyport, my thought is um, it's the programming that's offered. And it's the facility. So lack of facilities right. here has forced the hand of not having a lot of options for programs. So once we can do that and we have the space, we can offer more and it'll draw more people in with me. Obviously, yeah, I agree. I I wholeheartedly agree. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You got it. All right. Um, if that's it, I appreciate the time from everybody this morning. It was uh, really great to get the information and to meet you all. And um, if I have any additional questions, I'll follow up through Tracy and, and Cindy. I have your emails. Okay. And um, uh, I guess you probably won't hear from me for a little while, um, but I expect within a couple of weeks I should have yeah. the document completed and uh, we can set up another meeting. And I know it's around the holidays, so I, I apologize if, <laughs> if it starts to get a little tricky to set up another meeting, but um, I'm sure we'll, we'll stick to it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Good. Thank you, Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.